guys and welcome back to the channel. Now, you might remember quite a few months ago, I posted a video on what I thought was the worst feature in Snowflake, and it was the use of JavaScript to create store procedures. And I come from a world originally where I was using SQL Server quite a lot, and creating and working with procedures, store procedures, was the backbone of everything that we used to do. And what I really liked about that is that store procedures were really accessible. So I could go into a query window like this and literally just go create proc as and then start writing my SQL statements here. Give it a name. Execute that. That would create my store procedure with my SQL logic in there. And at any time I needed to call that store procedure, I could just run something like that. Really easy, really accessible to get all the benefits that store procedures give you in terms of pre-compiled code, better security. You can input certain parameters to, to that as well. And it makes for great code reuse and automation. So a lot of people coming to Snowflake are coming from a world where they've been used to using this approach in the past, where it's been really easy to get going with SQL Server, Oracle, and various other products as well. And then they move to a world like Snowflake where everything's really easy and you can deliver value really quickly. All the things that we all come to know and love about Snowflake, then you get into to store procedures and then you realize it was in JavaScript. Well, that's moved on a little bit now with the introduction of something called Snowflake Scripting. This was brought in a few months ago and it's been on my list to get to and, and produce a video around. And essentially it's an extension to the Snowflake SQL language and it supports procedural logic. And one of those things that it supports is the ability to write store procedures using SQL code. Now, it's not the only programming language that's supported. As I mentioned, JavaScript's still there and still around, but also you can now use Python, Scala, and Java, but they're mainly with regards to Snowpark. So in this video, I'm gonna talk you through how to get started with using Snowflake scripting and SQL store procedures. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to look at how to create a basic store procedure. And this is an example from the Snowflake documentation that exists. Notice that I'm in Snow site here, so that's the next generation web UI. I just want to show you how this works initially. So we've got create a replace procedure. We're giving it a name called output message. And we're specifying the fact that we can input a message into the call of this sort of procedure. It's going to return a varchar. The language crucially is SQL here. And we're simply just going to go begin return the message value. If I just execute that, it still says function and not store procedure or procedure. So function output message successfully created. If I copy this and take it into the classic web UI and paste it in here, execute that. I now get an error. Okay, so this is the first thing to take a note that we need to do something slightly different depending on what we're using to create a store procedure. So Either you're using SnowSight and this kind of uh, construct will work just fine. If I flick to here now, if we're using Snow SQL or the classic web UI, which is obviously what we're in now, we need to put these dollar signs to encapsulate the logic within these dollar signs to allow the sort procedure to compile correctly. If we execute that, now it creates fine. To call or execute the store procedure, we're using the call command. So again, very similar syntax to what we'd be doing if we were using JavaScript. We pass in a message and we get that message back as you would expect. Okay, so let's build on this procedure now by introducing um, the concept of variable declaration and how we do that within this block. So the first thing that we're gonna do is that we're not gonna pass in any input value anymore. So we can get rid of that. Within the block, just before the begin end block, in fact, we can now declare variables within here. So we can go declare a variable one var one, give it a data type, and we can give a default value to that variable. In this case, we're gonna just give it hello world. 
Now we want our procedure to return that variable value. We obviously don't need to pass in anything into our procedure anymore. So that can go as well. We'll recreate our procedure. Oh, and one thing that you need to remember is a semicolon at the end of that statement. Now that will create successfully and we can call the procedure and it's returning that value. And just to kind of prove that, let's just put a, a zero in there, call it again, and you can see that's coming out on the output message as well. There is another variation where we can specify and declare our variable values in line within the begin end block. So let me show you how to do that. We can get rid of that and that. And then we're gonna take this line, we're gonna cut this and we're gonna put it in line within our begin and end blocks. And this time we're gonna use the keyword let. So we've still got var1, we've still got the data type, varchar. And this time we're using this to specify the value that we wanna assign. We'll run that again and execute. So that's how you do it in line. So that is variable declaration. Let's continue building on this now where we're gonna look at binding variables. Again, I covered this in um, another video around SQL injection, which was almost a follow-up to the JavaScript store procedure video. It's a little bit more straightforward using Snowflake scripting. So this time we're gonna do something a tiny bit more interesting than just returning the value. We're gonna now say create or replace table, give it a name, test as select, and we're gonna specify our var1 value as call one. So we've created that successfully. We'll execute that. We get a null coming back to us. If I go into here, refresh my database objects, expand the schema, there's my test table. And if I select from that particular table, my call one, which is what I alias my column name as, contains the value. So that is how you bind your variable values within your statements. So, so far I've been hard coding the variable values, but what if I wanna take a value and input that into the variable you know, from a, a return result from a query, for example. So let's take a look at that next. To do that, we're gonna keep our variable in there, but this time we're gonna just change it to an integer and remove the default. Next, we can remove this statement in its entirety. And we're just gonna select 10 and specify into, and again, we use the colon var1. This time we probably wanna return what that looks like. So let's pop that here, recreate our procedure and call it and there we go. So in this case now, we've run a query. Obviously in this case, I've hard coded that in a select statement, but that can be anything you want as you can imagine. Assign that value into var1 and return that as part of the stored procedure. Now, so far, everything I've done, I've created a procedure or replaced it and then called it. You may come across something called execute immediate, and you may see these in some examples that are out there on the internet. And essentially what that does is it negates the need for you to create a procedure. You can actually execute that SQL script and procedure logic on the fly. So if I replace these three lines with execute immediate and remove the as I can then just execute that block on the fly and that's the purpose of execute immediate it will it will immediately execute that SQL statement that, or that string 
immediately beneath it. So one way of being able to quickly test and troubleshoot anything before you put it into a store procedure create statement command. There's also a lot of other things that you can do from store procedures such as error handling and different kind of conditional logic and looping and branching. I'll go through one more example and you can let me know in the comments if you find this useful if you want to go through anything else. More than happy to add it to the list and put together another example for you. In this case, I just want to go through some conditional logic quite quickly. So if I declare a variable outside externally to my begin end block, again, I'll call it var1 and I'm going to give it a default of 10. Now in here, I'm going to get rid of that for now. And I'm going to say, okay, so if my variable value is greater than 10. Then return more than 10. Otherwise return less than 10. I'm going to end that if statement. And again, something I need to get in the habit of doing more is terminating each statement with a semicolon, including this one. And so you see, I'm running this as execute immediate again, so it runs immediately. I've got a default value of 10. And so what happens if I change that to 11? I get more than 10, if I change it to nine, I get less than 10. So that's one way of using if and case statements to have conditional logic and enter the world of branching. So as I said, I hope you found that useful. One other thing I wanna just show you quickly is this example by uh, Philip Hoffer. He put a good uh, brief article on Medium, which I will include in the video description below. Um, but he basically provides a really good example where SQL scripting, using it for store procedures, comes into play and kind of simplifies the logic that you may have existing within your Snowflake environment if you only had the JavaScript variant available previously. Here we're merging a source to a target table on a particular primary key. When you're using JavaScript, you have to kind of go through a, a loop, if you like, comparing each column to the next to see if there's a difference in the column before deciding what to do. Here, using SQL, it's obviously set-based, and we can join on that primary key. When it's matched, then we're doing a set-based update, and when it's not matched, then we can do an insert. A lot simpler, a lot more straightforward. It's gonna be much easier for people with a SQL background who are using this typically, data engineers and so on, to write that piece of logic rather than try to get this JavaScript syntax correct first time round. So I hope you found that useful. If you did, please like and subscribe. New videos coming soon. I also wanted to let you know about our Master and Snowflake program with myself that we run, and it's, it's an exclusive signature program to help you master Snowflake and learn how to design, implement, and scale solutions in the cloud. And I've designed this program specifically for those people who have either scratched the surface using Snowflake or who are stuck working with legacy on-premise technologies and haven't been invested in by their companies and have fallen behind in their career. And what I've done is packaged up my knowledge and experience of working with Snowflake since 2017 and learning how to package up Snowflake's out-of-the-box capabilities in a way where you can apply them in the real world to address common challenges. So this program isn't about theory. Of course, I need to introduce you to the concepts if you're new to Snowflake, and many of my members are, but it's really about introducing the theory and then in practice, how you apply those in the real world. I've been through the pain of understanding what works and what doesn't. Now I've got a formula or a set of recipes, if you like, that show you how to do that. So the Master in Snowflake program includes in-depth, on-demand video course content that I've created they all include practical hands-on demos. I provide access to all the code, templates, and files that I use as part of those demos. So you can download them and use them freely. 
You may want to use them in your day-to-day -day work. You may want to take them and customize them and use them as a starting point. All members on the program get exclusive access to a members-only group where everybody can help each other out and share their knowledge and best practice and get expert advice. Finally, I also carry out a group 60-minute coaching call with all the members, totally optional, where you can ask me anything about Snowflake, data analytics, data strategy, data architecture, you name it, um, interview advice, and I can help you and give my um, input and help and support and guidance around that. Finally, you'll get lifetime access to all feature updates. Snowflake's changing and evolving. There's new features and releases every week, and you'll continue to benefit from those updates as well. At a high level, there's 10 modules. This is what we cover, everything ranging from the Snowflake architecture to getting data into Snowflake. And then once you've got data, how do you effectively use it, secure it, share it, and work with it to ensure that you get the maximum value from your Snowflake implementation? If you're interested, I've included the application link in the video description below. If this sounds like the thing that you're looking for and you want to supercharge your career, and if you're ready to take the ultimate step, I'd really encourage you to fill out the application form below.